This moment, Whew. okay, we made it to this moment. Uh, thank you for coming, everybody. I'm nervous, I'm super nervous. So the thing to do when you're super nervous uh, to break the ice is you make sure you pay respect to those that are there before you. Mom and Dad, I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for coming to my ceremony and traveling. Miss Vicky, thank you for flying in. I can't thank you enough for your friendship and you traveling to be here with us. Lucas, Miss Ella, my niece and nephew, I love you guys. I love you guys very much. Thank you so much for being here. We have had an appetite all my life. I've been there for me. Support me all the way. Thank you. Master Sergeant Michael McDaniel and crew. The posse. My family throughout the years. My best friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Mo. Major Moses Thomas. My mentor. My teacher. Always supporting me, always coaching me, always correcting me. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Jones, a mentor, a teacher, a supporter, encouraging, teaching, pushing me to do the right thing, to do good work to help others at all times. Sir, I really appreciate you always putting up with me. Thank you very much, Semper Fi. Thank you for always taking care of me and being a mentor and a teacher to me. To the crew, to the sailors here, thank you so much. Thank you for spending this time with me. Bert, our air operations officer, my fellow Marine officer aboard, I always looked up to you and uh, wanted to make sure you, uh, you know, approve of what I was doing and, and being that Marine counterpart of yours that had a piece of pie. And uh, you drove uh, our air operations here on ship and I, and I tried to make sure all the logistics behind that was squared away. So thank you for always uh, supporting me and uh, taking care of me during that process. So I got some themes. I don't need to take too long. I think the thing about these speeches is you can go too long with them. Somebody in the back checks their watch, or you know, we got we got more stuff to do on the plan of the day, so you start checking watches and, and seeing what's next. I'm I'm well aware of that. So I'll take a, just a few moments. I'll check my watch. Time on deck 1041. We'll keep this down. And like I said, just super nervous. So I'll go up. I wrote down some themes for to, to give a speech so I can have a big blue arrow and stay on course. So uh, one of the themes, I got four, I'm going to pick one. The first one I had was, the Marines give an overly political, elongated speech about the higher chain of command even though you're not qualified to speak towards that. I think I'll skip that one. The Marines, what did you do that for? I'll touch on that one. I like, I'm going to do that one a little bit. The Marines, the big, green, weedy, and other horrible analogies about the core. Dead quiet. I'm not going to do that one. I was, I was with some guys at the DFW when I wrote, when I wrote that one. I'm going to skip that one.
The Marines. Navy and Marine Corps integration. Is it really working? I'm going to touch on that one, I think, too. I'm going to touch on that one. But I'll go back to this one real quick. The Marines. What did you do that for? Well, now that it's over, I'll, I'll try to get over being nervous, and I'll just do a, a really quick story time. It was the 80s, the early 80s. Probably going on to Camp Lejeune, I believe. Could have been 83 or so, about six <coughs> years or so. I'm in Dad's truck. I'm looking at the, the sign for the Marine Corps base as we, as we come aboard. And I was wanting to talk to my dad about stuff or bring up conversations. So I'm like, Dad, what does it deal with the Marines? I mean, if they're kind of like the Army, I guess. And my dad looked at me with his dad face, kind of does this, kind of talks to himself a little bit. Like, and then he's thinking about what he's going to say. And to, to my comment, Dad, what, are, what is the Marines all about? They're a lot like the Army. And he explained it to me, and I never forgot what he told me. He said, son, the Marines are like soldiers from the sea. They do have weapons and guns and trucks, and they've got a lot of it. And we're really good at using all that stuff. But the things that makes us different is that we come from the sea. And we've been doing that with the U.S. Navy as long as there's been a Marine Corps. So as a little sixth grade boy, I learned quick there was something different about the Marines and they were indeed a fighting force but not like the army and all that land stuff that the Marines come from the sea. So through the years growing up in the 80s I was always love to express myself. I love to put up skateboard posters all over my room and play my trumpet and do things that I like to do to uh, express myself, right? It was the 80s, you could do that then. But there was all, and all that self-expression and all the skateboard pictures and all the CDs and tapes and records and all that stuff, I always kept a little spot. I kept a little spot in my room that was dedicated to the Marines. Because I would see my dad come and go, come and go to work, live around the bases, live around Marines all my life. It was just my environment growing up. And uh, I knew there was just something special there about it, even though I was too young to do anything about it, to really, you know, really get into it a whole lot other than understand, you know, what my dad did as a Marine and understand that there's bases and Marines come and go and deploy and they work hard and they get called up, they gotta go. That little spot in my room, I always kept that and I was very proud of that little spot. So by the time I was 18 and 19 and doing absolutely nothing my parents approved of and just really just doing nothing that, that would seem like some sort of a big blue arrow positive direction, you know, worrying my mother to death. I kind of got to a point right there where I would be working, I had a job, I had a job as a laborer, I was picking up hoses and, and walking around with a wheelbarrow on an oil refinery because the, the job at the record store I had kind of ran dry, there was only so much money to be made there, so, and I didn't really have any skills. So uh, when I'm going to school and I was rolling hoses and walking around with a wheelbarrow and being a laborer at the oil refinery, and uh, it wasn't, certainly wasn't getting out of hard work, but that was a little bit of inspiration. I knew that I wanted to do something more. And I would think back to that spot in my room where I always kept that uh, little shrine towards the Marine Corps. So the Marines, what did you do that for, right? Um, I did it because all my life, I just knew there was something special right there that, that was different and that they were not like the army and they were the best force ever and I had it in my head that I was ready and willing to serve my country 
And I'll be damned, I was going to walk into a U.S. Army office. There's just no way I was going to do that. So I walked out of a bar one night. I went to a payphone, back in, you know, payphone. And I dialed on the payphone. And the staff sergeant picked up the phone. And he was like, I can't remember his name. Staff sergeant, so-and-so, you know, how can I help you? I said, well, my name's Shane Dewey. I'm joining the Marine Corps. He said, okay, slow down. He said, are you on drugs? And I said, no, I'm not. He said, okay. He said, well, uh, how old are you? I said, I'm, I'm 21. He said, okay. He said, did you graduate from high school? I said, I did. Okay. He said, uh, well, are, are you in trouble with the law? And I said, I am not. And then he paused because he's screaming me out, you know, just real quick on the phone like a good recruiter should, just trying to pick up a bead on whether he wants to keep talking to me on the phone or not. So the, after he asked me those questions, the last question he asked me, he said, okay, all right. Well, how tall are you and how much do you weigh? And I said, well, I'm like five, seven. I don't know how much I weigh, like 130 pounds or something. And he goes, okay, all right. Do you need a ride? And I said, I, I, I do. I need a ride. You can pick me up. So this green staff sergeant came up to the bar. And I left that payphone, and I got into the vehicle, and it's at that time, you know, I let him know. I was like, hey, look, here's the deal. Um, here's the deal, dude. I grew up around the Marine Corps all my life. I, my dad is a retired Marine. I'm totally qualified to be in the Marine Corps. We don't need to talk about it. You don't need to sell me. You don't need to tell me a bunch of stories. I don't even really want to hear it. What I want you to do is put me in. And the staff sergeant looked at me, and he just kind of, you know, kind of leaned back. Just rode right on back down to New Orleans. He knew he, that, he, that he had he had one. Well, he tested me out. Then I passed the ASVAB and I did really good on the ASVAB. And then he was happy. And then he was super happy. And that's it. And I didn't look back. I wound up falling in love with working in the Marine Corps. And I wound up falling in love with busting my butt in the Marine Corps and having a great time and jumping out of planes and learning skills and figuring out how to do logistics and have a whole bunch of people and cargo and equipment in the right place at the right time for the right reasons within the right budget. And I learned all of that in the Marine Corps. And uh, I just, I never look back and I'm so thankful I did that. But it just all kind of started just with, uh, with realizing how special people are, Marines are. Around the base, old dad, Captain America, good times for coming to dinner. Not a word. This man never, not one word did he ever say, you know, hey, you know it's a good idea, son. You might want to uh, do something, like join the Marines. You might want to do that. He never, not a word. He never asked me to, never said one word of it at dinner. So it's all me, I, I can claim it. That was my idea, and I'm on the back end of it now. Navy and Marine Corps integration. Is it really working? I think it is. I think it is working. I have a fan, General, I mean, I have, a, I am a fan of uh, a wonderful uh, Marine leader and speaker, his name is General Kaufman, but I want to capture some of what he said, and he said, that, you know, Navy and Marine Corps, we better get it right, and we need to figure out how to stay together, technically, fiscally, and operationally. And I'm on the back end of four ships, a lot of sea time, along with my dirt tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. If I was just that little part of Navy and Marine Corps integration, on the ground, in the hangar, on the flight deck, in the meetings, taking care of an air ground task force that comes aboard, everything from the little stuff, like is there curtains on your rack and did you get a pillow, to the important stuff and the big stuff, like did we get everything out, in the appropriate time, in accordance with a crisis response or a rapid response planning process, did we make that happen? Did everything go top-notch perfect for those Marines getting into the fight and getting off the ship? 
and going off to meet their objective. I like to think that I was a little positive part of the Navy and Marine Corps being integrated in that way. And I'm very proud of that, and it means the world to me, and I will carry that with me. So to the sailors that are here behind us, to my wardroom friends and members here, I really, really took it serious. I believe that my father's words from being a little boy, you know, the soldiers from the sea, Marines come from the sea. I'm a lucky Marine. My generation, the Iraq OIF, Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom generation, there's so many of my peers that don't have any sea time, and it's nobody's fault. And we're all like, you know, gunnery sergeants, chief warrant officers. I met a master gunner the other day, never been on a ship. <laughs> Ooh, how is that possible? Where have you been? Um, but that's real in our, my generation of the Marines right now. So I'm very proud to be a small part of bringing us back together, Iraq and Afghanistan, all those tours, all those trips. You gave us a ride on the amphib vessels that really dropped us off in Iraq or Afghanistan to conduct that deployment and that tour. Then you got back on and came home. And we weren't really working together and operating together. Um, but those days are now back. And for the sailors here, I need y'all to remember that. And remember that this ship is designed to carry Marines and carry Marine Corps equipment and aviation assets. And I need you to remember that. And I need you to welcome us when we flood the ship and make the chow line really, really long. I need you to remember that we belong here too. And uh, it's our place to be out here with you and bring just the right amount of people and the right amount of equipment and have the right things in place for us to conduct crisis action response across the world. Navy and Marine Corps integration. I just look forward to uh, having that always be near and dear to my heart. I really wish the very best for all of you sailors sitting here with me today. Thank you so much for spending that time with me. And please remember to always welcome the landing forces aboard. Take care of them. Help them. We're one team. And that's the way we need to operate. So, I think I'm done with my themes. I talked about why I'm doing the report and kind of how it got into my head to do it. Um, I really wish you guys the best and, 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 and always have a, a, some great integrating days. And the future of the America is going to be awesome. It's going to be just something cool to see. It's going to be the Joint Strike Fighter. It's going to be Pelagorn Infantry Companies. And it's going to be a lot of things. Because to be honest with you, in my own community, I was known as that, that Marine with no road deck. Okay? Coming to a meeting, who is that? Oh, that's, that's the chief one officer with no world deck. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is plenty of fuel, strike capability, away from the beach, lots of capability, lots of things to bring to the fight, command and control vessel. That's the other way to look at the employment of the America. So I will be armchair quarterback in that. I will keep my eye on the news for all of you out there and doing wonderful things and doing great things out in the fleet and across our planet. So that's it for me. I really appreciate y'all serving with me and I appreciate your friendship. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, please let me know. I'll finish off with uh, Good old Chesty Puller, because I love him. I'm just a big Chesty Puller fan. And when, uh, when Chesty Puller got out, his, his parting words were, uh, you know, if I could see and shake the hands, see the faces and shake the hands of every Marine sailor I ever served with, that would be what I want. So, I'll miss you guys. Hoorah!
Side boys, post. 